Practice service with Rob and Junior. They're going to come and light um, district advent candles. Actually, you're going to light all four, other than the middle one. Today, we relight the first three candles of the Advent wreath, the candles of hope, peace, and joy. And today, we light the fourth candle of Advent. This is the candle of love. Jesus demonstrated self-giving love in his ministry as the Good Shepherd. Advent is a time for kindness, thinking of others and sharing with others. It is a time to love as God loved us by giving us his most important gift. As God is love, let us love also. In the Gospel of John, we hear, I give you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also should love one another, for by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here together from various places. Each one of us comes here having had a different week. Some of us have had an amazing week. Some of us have had a really difficult week. And I pray, Lord, that you'd meet us where we are. You would give us what we need this day to be able to move forward in you in the week to come. Uh, comfort those who need comforting. Convict those who need conviction. Strengthen those and encourage those who need encouragement. And in all things, Lord, may we just give you praise and thanks for your goodness and for all that you've done for us and for your many blessings, even amidst difficult times. We pray, Lord, for your, your spirit and your presence and for your love to permeate this place this, this morning. And may we leave this place drawn closer to you. May we leave this place in somehow different, somehow different than how we walked in. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The lighting of the Advent candles is its like signposts on a journey. We're walking towards something. We're walking towards something together. Something that uh, we know happened and is continuing to happen in the hearts of people all around the world. And it also points us towards something in the future that we know is going to happen someday when Jesus not only came, he not only comes into the hearts of people who trust him and, and live according to, to the call that he issues to the world, but he also, you know, he will come again someday. And uh, that's the journey that the Advent candles remind us of. My hope, the first candle was hope. My hope is a person. And that person has a plan to comfort and to heal creation, starting with the human heart and spreading out. And that hope creates peace within me, which is the second candle, because through his plan, though I have work to do, though there are things that I am called to do, it's his strength, not mine, that will bring about the fulfillment of his plan. And that peace sparks within me a sense of joy. Joy that is light fed by love. A light in me that says, as we talked about last week, it says to the darkness, you can only gather around us, but you can't come in. And as I say, that joy is a light that is fed by love. And not just a warm and fuzzy love, not a romantic love. It's a love that is active. It's a love that does stuff. It holds people as precious. It gives generously. It stays faithful. And it expresses delight in you and in me, and especially in all of us together. This is love that says to us, love as I have loved you. And love because I loved you first. And it says love the insiders, love the outsiders, and even love the enemy. This is an active, holding, giving, faithful, celebrating love 
that is given to us and is commanded of us by the one person who is our hope and our peace and our joy. So as we continue in our adventures, in including some vocabulary in American Sign Language in our worship time because of the absence of music, we remember that at one point we lit the candle. Come on, you can do it. The candle of hope was first, followed by the candle of peace, followed by the candle of joy. And this week we have lit the candle of love. So we're going to speak together some words that will be on the screen. And um, let these words speak to your heart, let them speak to your mind, let them speak to your spirit. And as we sit still and speak these words, let them speak to your physical reality. Let them speak to your body. Let them speak love into who you are right now in this moment. So we begin by saying, we light this candle because we live in love. We wake every day knowing what God has promised, that because he loved us, he gave his only son, that anyone who believes in him will never perish, but will have eternal life. We light this candle because we live in love. He has lived a life like ours, our pain, our sorrow, our temptation. He will give new life to us and through us. We light this candle because we live in love. This is what he has promised, and his promises will be kept. We light this candle because we live in love. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Hello. You know, I always like sharing about God because he's done so much in my life. And this is more a word of encouragement. Sometimes in your, your life, things may not look as though God's hand is there. But if you remain patient, in the end you look right from birth to where you are, you see how merciful God has been to you. This year has been a trying year for all of us. All of us, we, some people have lost their jobs, I have been fortunate that I, even when I wasn't working, I was getting paid and I had my benefits intact. And I want to thank God for that because it is because of his mercy that I was able to be able to stay on top of things. But I had an experience earlier in the year that really shook my spirituality in the sense that I'm saying, okay, Lord, where did I go wrong to, to lose all that I have lost? And sometimes it's a humbling experience because sometimes we do things because it looks like a good idea at the time, but it's always important to see God in every situation in our lives because so long as we put him first, everything else work out according to his will for our lives. Because in the midst of it, I found myself realizing, okay, I need to be more connected. So you might have not seen me as regular as I used to be here. It's not that I have abandoned the church. It's just I need it a little bit more because I need to be that connected that I know that I know that I know what God is really saying to me. So in the midst of what we are going through now, just keep pressing on in him because he is so worth it because he loved us so much and the more we understand his love is more we become connected to him. So I urge you guys, this is the end of one year and we're about to start the other year. 
Let us sink ourselves in his word. Let us sink ourselves in prayer. And let us see God so real in our lives that in spite of what come our way, we know that he has our backs. So God, I give you honor, I give you praise. Congregation, let the peace of God be yours for this year and the year coming forward. He has blessed you with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You are more than a conqueror in him. You are righteous by faith in Christ Jesus. He said it, you believe it, and it is so. God bless you. Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18, says, This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she, found, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said to the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this story of Christmas that has so many different angles to it, but which all point to Jesus, which all point to the one who will deliver us from our sins. I pray, Lord God, that you would help us as we look at this story to be able to take what it is you're saying to us and apply it to our hearts and apply it to our lives. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time, it's yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So when we think of the story of Christmas, there are many different people that come to mind. Obviously, there's the baby Jesus. There's Mary, the shepherds, the angels, the wise men. But one person we don't often think about is Joseph. If you ever had a chance growing up in church to play Joseph in a Christmas pageant as a kid, your job pretty much consisted of standing there and just looking adoringly at Mary and, and the baby and you just kind of stood there. Or maybe you were walking alongside a very pregnant Mary uh, as she made her way to Bethlehem. But Joseph was more than just an observer. He was an important part of the story of Christmas. Now Joseph was the great, 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 26 times great grandson of King David. He was of the house and lineage of David, and yet his life and lifestyle did not reflect royalty. Joseph decided at a young age that he was going to take up a trade, worked well with his hands, I guess he wasn't a book learner, and he decided to become a carpenter. He was maybe 20, 21 years old, and had begun building a reputation among his family and friends, both for his work ethic and for his devout faith in God. He was known, even at a young age, as a righteous man. He was a faithful Jew who strove to obey the law, to love the Lord his God with all his heart, his soul, his mind, and his strength. And as most men his age did at that time, he began to consider the idea of getting married and raising a family. And the young woman that caught his eye was a girl named Mary. Now, Mary was probably about 15 years of age, and many of her friends of her age had already been pledged to be married. So, so when Joseph approached her family and asked for Mary to be pledged to him, it was not something unexpected. And Mary too was also very faithful, a very devout young woman who desired to love God and to serve God. And she strove to live a life that was at the same time humble and yet pleasing to God. Now Joseph found this very attractive. And he began to make plans to take Mary as his wife and to build a life together with her. 
And as Joseph worked in his shed, he didn't find it wrong to, you know, kind of think ahead. He thought of, of how he could use his skills to build all the furnishings that they would need for their home. He would earn a good living from his work and, you know, working for others in Nazareth, and he could provide for Mary and their children. The thought of children brought a smile to Joseph's face. He hoped to have many kids, and though he would love to have daughters, he, he looked forward to having sons that he could teach his trade to in those days. And he would bring up all of his children to fear the Lord and to honor the Lord and to obey him as his parents had taught him. Now Joseph had a good life pretty well planned out for himself. Until that day when the news came that upset the fig cart and brought everything crashing down around him, Mary was pregnant. This brought tremendous disgrace upon everyone involved. But for Joseph, he felt more pain than humiliation. He, he, he was hurt. He loved Mary, and he couldn't figure out why she would cheat on him like this. He, he was confused. This was something totally out of character for Mary. He, he thought he knew her. This was something he never dreamed would have happened. He was scared, not so much for himself, but he was scared for Mary. For the Jewish law demanded that anyone caught in adultery would be stoned to death. And since being pledged to be married in that society was, was a much stronger commitment than, say, engagement is today, Mary's situation would surely be seen as an adulterous one, and her life was in danger. Joseph was hurt, he was confused, he was scared, and yet he still loved Mary. He had every right to be angry. He had every right to drag her before the chief priests and have her condemned. He could have easily held her up to public disgrace and humiliation, but there was still one thing. Joseph still loved Mary. And so he made a decision. He gave up his rights, his right to justice, his right to indignation, his right to be right, Love does that sometimes, for love is not self-seeking, and love keeps no record of wrongs. So Joseph decided to take care of this quietly. He decided he could not go through with the marriage, but he didn't want to, any harm to come to Mary either. So he decided to divorce Mary quietly without any kind of fuss without any kind of accusation or demand for justice or retribution. He would, he would quietly go on with his life, and he would let Mary quietly go on with hers. Joseph's plans had been turned upside down. But Joseph not only loved Mary, he loved God. And he's willing to follow God's plans for his life. And just as Mary had turned his plans upside down, so God had some plans of his own that would again throw Joseph totally for a loop. So Joseph was sleeping one night, and the Lord came to him in a dream. And the angel told Joseph God's plan, that Joseph should not be afraid to take Mary as his wife because she had been chosen by God to bear the Messiah, the one who would deliver people from their sins. This was not an ordinary baby to be born. Mary had been chosen by God to carry the Son of God. And Joseph was being told by the angel that God wanted him to be a part of the plan as well. Now, Joseph knew God well enough to know the difference between a dream featuring a real angel, a dream that was a word from God, and a dream that resulted maybe from eating some rotten fish. Uh, Joseph knew, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that God had spoken to him. The news was incredible and difficult to wrap his head around, but Joseph had no doubt that this was from God and this was true. And he knew what he had to do. He would take Mary for his wife. He knew that this decision would be one that his friends and family would not be able to understand. He knew that this decision would have consequences and not all of them would be good. But God had spoken to him and love and faith compelled him to obey, knowing that he wasn't alone, knowing that God would be there through everything. 
When he made his intention known to his family and friends, they all tried to dissuade him. Sure, I, I know Joseph, you love Mary, but how can you ever trust her? How could he even consider raising a child that wasn't his own? Mary had betrayed him, and she deserved the punishment that was coming to her. The more opinionated of his friends, the more blunt of his friends, declared that Mary was a tramp, and that Joseph was throwing his life away by consenting to marry her. But love doesn't look down on someone because of the opinions of others. Love is mer merciful. Love is gracious. Love gives second chances. It always hopes, always perseveres. Love never gives up. Love never fails. So Joseph made his way to speak to Mary, and she too had been all but completely ostracized by her family and friends. And they were surprised to see Joseph coming to see her, her family and friends were surprised to see Joseph coming at least they were surprised to see him coming alone. They thought he would be bringing a whole bunch of people from the chief priests to come and drag Mary away. Joseph took Mary aside privately, and as they began to speak, the words came out from both their mouths almost in unison. You're not going to believe what happened to me. An angel. God had prepared both Mary and Joseph for the task that he had called them to. By preparing them in a way that was rather special, and rather unique, rather unmistakable. God had sent angels to both Mary and Joseph in order to explain the plan and to tell him, tell them that his hand was upon each of them. Now Joseph still could have said no, could have said no to the angel, could have said no to God's plan, and Mary could have said no. Joseph could have said to God, you know, you're just asking too much of me that while some would believe their story, there would still be many family and friends who would not understand. And many would cut the young couple out of their lives. There would be many who would, would gossip and think the worst. There would be many who would wonder how two seemingly righteous people could go so far off track. But love always trusts. Love trusts that God knows what he's doing, even when it may not make sense even when it had never been done that way before, even if others don't understand. And Joseph was willing to step into this unusual plan to bring Messiah into the world, this strange way to save the world. There would be days when it might seem like it was he and Mary against the world, but he loved God and he loved Mary enough to be willing to take this journey. He would do what God had told him to do. So Joseph took Mary as his wife. And together they would face the gossips and the finger waggers. Together they would try to explain the unexplainable to their family and friends. Together they would fulfill God's call and purpose for their lives. Now Joseph, as all men in his society did when taking on a wife, brought Mary under his care. He would work to provide for her, and for his family. He would watch over her and stand against any who would try to harm her, for love always protects. But Joseph had a deeper call to protect than any other man in his society. For, mother, for Mary was going to be the mother of the Messiah, the Son of God. And Mary would be the victim of those who would not understand. But Joseph, Joseph knew the truth. And Joseph would stand by her side and walk with her through the challenges of pregnancy, through the assumptions of others, walk with her on that long journey to the manger in Bethlehem. A couple of years later, after the, the Magi, the three wise men, had visited the Christ child, Joseph again experienced another visit from an angel. And Joseph was told, was told that Jesus' life was in great danger because of this maniacal King Herod who was going to kill all the boys in the area and that they as a family should, should flee to Egypt in order to be safe. And Joseph knew to trust in the word of the Lord as delivered by an angel, and so he gathered up his family and off they went to Egypt. For love always protects one of the main ways a father shows his love is through protection. 
Our Heavenly Father protects us. And though we may experience pain and suffering in this world, ultimately He protects us from all real harm. And so as earthly fathers, we, like Joseph, are called to show God's love by protecting and watching over those that God has entrusted to our care. And even for those of us who aren't biological fathers, there are many young people in this world who are without the protection of a father and who yearn for it and need it, even if they may not always realize it. In a story filled with love, Joseph shows us in many ways the love of God working through his actions and his decisions. In love, he decided not to lash out at someone who had hurt him, decided not to claim his rights. In love, he showed mercy and compassion. In love, Joseph showed obedience. He showed that love for God is deeply connected to obedience. And that once he was made aware of God's plan, he stepped out immediately and with no questions asked, obeyed. In love and obedience, Joseph showed that he trusted God fully, that he trusted God completely. In love, Joseph was willing to suffer alongside someone else. He was willing to be misunderstood and to bear with Mary the scorn of those who did not understand. In love, Joseph rose up to be the protector of his wife and child watching over God's gift to the world, the gift beyond value. We may still picture Joseph as a child in a Christmas pageant wearing a house coat, silently watching the events and the little baby doll in the manger. And that is something he may well have done. He was an observer to the events, but, but he wasn't some secondary player in this celestial drama. He was intricately involved, and his faith and his love shone forth as an example to us today. Kneeling by the manger, thinking about everything that had unfolded, how his well-laid-out plans had been so drastically changed, Joseph no doubt marveled at God's plan. That God would choose him, a simple carpenter, instead of some great king that God would choose a manger in a barn instead of a palace, that God would choose an unknown young girl instead of a princess, that God would choose a helpless baby instead of a powerful prince. It may seem strange to some, but God came to save the world in simplicity, in humility, and in love. Watch the screen, please. Father, we thank you that, um, that you have a plan, and you had a plan. That may seem strange and unusual to some, even to those who may have been right in the middle of that plan. But we thank you, Lord, that um, you sent your Son in the humility, the lowliness of a a manger in a stable or a cave, and that you worked through two unknown, fairly ordinary people to accomplish something that would change the world and save the world. Thank you, Lord, that you give us stories of people who followed you in your word that can be inspirational to us and be examples to us. And I thank you, Lord, for this example of Joseph and showing us what love and obedience can accomplish, not just in his life, but in the life of generations to follow right down to today. And Lord, I pray that you would help us and give us your ability to love, to love no matter what other people say to love even in difficult situations, to love even when we're hurt and confused. Help us to be able to share your love with those around us and to experience it ourselves from you. And Lord, help us to obey. Lord, very few of us will ever get angels to tell us what to do, but we do have your Holy Spirit. We do have your word that leads us and guides us and shows us how you want us to live. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us and give us the strength to be obedient, 
to do what you want us to do, to fulfill the purposes you've placed us here for, so that your plan can be accomplished to impact and influence the people around us, that they may know you and be able to live the lives you've created them to live. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this message of Christmas, and we thank you for the example that you show us in the life of Joseph. Help us, Lord, to live in love and to live in obedience. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. None of us will experience what Joseph did. That was a once and forever experience. It's unique. But we can still learn from his example. And the same God who called him to reach out in love and obedience, to do something significant that would change the world, is calling us as well in our own sphere of influence to, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to listen to God's voice as he leads us and shows us where he wants us to go, what he wants us to do that can change the world around us. The same God that called Joseph is also calling us to our own, to walk our own walk before God and to do what God has called, wants us to do. So that's our challenge this week as we head towards Christmas, to let that same love permeate our hearts and lives and to determine what it is God is asking us to do to serve him and to the power of Christ to change the lives of the people around us.